Joe Alton, MD of Survival Top 50's Reader's Choice website, doomandbloom.net, with over a thousand articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness. Together with my wife, Amy Alton, an advanced registered nurse practitioner, we are the authors of the Book Excellence Award winner in medicine, The Survival Medicine Handbook, now in its 700-page third edition, the brand new book, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease, The Layman's Guide to Available Antibacterials in Austere Settings, and the design of an entire line of medical kits and supplies at store.doomandbloom.net. In normal times, we have the luxury of modern medical facilities that can isolate a sick patient from healthy people. In a survival scenario, however, most organized medical care will no longer exist, and that's going to force the average citizen into the role of medic for his or her family or community. Although we may be thrown back to the 19th century medically by a disaster, we do have the benefit of knowledge about infections and hygiene, a lot more than our ancestors did, and knowing how contagious diseases are spread and how to sterilize supplies gives us a major advantage over those who came before us. Using this knowledge, it should be possible for a medically prepared person to put together a sick room or hospital tent that will minimize the chances of infectious disease running rampant throughout the community. We spent a good deal of time on that topic in our latest book. The cornerstone of care is to deal effectively and humanely with the sick while keeping the healthy from becoming infected. In the face of a looming catastrophe, you must first make the decision to either stay in place or to get out of Dodge. If you're staying in place, you have to choose a room where the sick will be cared for, and that room should be as far away as possible from common areas like the kitchen. It should have good ventilation, should have light, and preferably should have a door or other physical barrier that separates it from the rest of the retreat. That's so important. If the wiser choice is to leave the area, shelter becomes an issue, but it can be addressed with Tents, for example. Choose a tent as the sick room and place it on the periphery of the camp. Again, good ventilation is important to allow air circulation even in a tent. With sick rooms in a retreat or a camp, it's important to designate them well before a disaster occurs. For groups where a number of people are living together, procrastinating on this decision is going to cause somebody to lose their living space for the greater good. And this invariably breeds resentment at a time when everyone needs to pull together. Sometimes you're going to find that there isn't a spare room or tent to assign as a sick room. So if you only have a common area to deal with, Raise a makeshift barrier. Some plastic sheeting will do to separate the sick from the healthy. Even if you have a dedicated sick room, keep group members with injuries separate from those with infectious diseases, such as, say, influenza. Although wounds will sometimes become infected, these tend not to be contagious like epidemic diseases are. A sick room in a retreat with air conditioning won't qualify as decent ventilation when the power's down. And in this case, air ducts are actually more of a danger than a benefit because of microbes passing through the air ducts in a sick room to other areas of the home or the retreat may represent a risk for transmission of disease. Cover the ducts with tape and keep windows or tent flaps open except for particularly bad weather. You want to decrease the concentration of airborne microbes inside. That's very important to sort of let them sort of go out into the atmosphere and not stay in this one tiny little room. Of course, in areas with lots of insects, some screening or netting may be necessary. Furnishings in the sick room should be minimal with a work surface, an exam area, medical equipment, bed spaces, not really much more. In mild weather, some of these beds can be outside if needed, as long as shade is provided with a canopy or at least insect threats are taken into consideration. Hard surfaces are preferable to fabric upholstery in almost all cases. Cloth is harder to clean, can harbor disease-causing organisms. That's something that makes common sense. Even bedding, honestly, might best be covered in plastic. The more areas that can be disinfected easily, well, the better. It's important to have a way to eliminate waste products of bedridden patients, even if it's just a five gallon bucket with some bleach. Containers with lids should be made available to put used sick room items that need cleaning. A station should be set up near the entrance of the sick room or the hospital tent for caregivers, masks, gloves, gowns, aprons, other personal protection items that might be necessary, and have a good supply of these items. 
You'll also need a basin with water, soap, or other disinfectant, and thermometers should be available and dipped in alcohol. Many consider medical supplies to consist of gauze, tourniquets, and battle dressings, but you must also dedicate sets of sheets, towels, pillows, other items to be used in the sick room. Keep these items separate from the bedding, bathing, and eating materials of the healthy members of your family or group. All this seems like overkill to you, I know, but there never can be enough dedicated supplies for the sick. Make no mistake, you'll end up caring for more people than you planned for. You can bet that medical items will be expended much faster than you'd expect. Cleaning supplies should also be considered medical preparedness items. You're going to want to clean the sick room thoroughly on a daily basis. Hard surfaces should be regularly cleaned with soap and water or use other disinfectants such as a solution of one part bleach to nine parts water. Don't forget to disinfect the doorknobs, the tables, sinks, toilets, counters, even toys that children may be playing with. Wash bed sheets and towels frequently, boil them if you have to. As these items may carry disease-causing organisms, wear gloves and always wash your hands after use. The same goes for plates, cups, things like that, and any equipment brought into the sick room should stay there. Limit patient access to the medic or medics in the groups only, and at least provide personal protection gear like face masks to any visitors that you do allow to see the sick person. One additional item that'll be important for your sick room patients, give them a whistle or another noisemaker of some sort that will allow them to alert you when they need help. This will decrease anxiety, give them confidence that you'll know when they're in distress. The duties of a medic involve more than how to control bleeding or splint an orthopedic injury. Knowing how to put together an effective epidemic sick room will go a long way towards helping the sick get healthy and making sure the healthy stay that way. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Find out more about establishing a proper sick room and survival scenarios by checking out our new book, Alden's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease. And hey, don't forget to fill those holes in your medical storage by checking out Nurse Amy's entire line of medical kits, books, and more at store.doomandbloom.net. That's store.doomandbloom.net. You'll be glad you did.